Hi and welcome to the Borat Minda podcast, a Bahasa Roja podcast on mental health. I'm your host Zulaika and this episode is brought to you by AIA Malaysia for the AIA See the Other Side campaign that aims to drive conversations on mental health, lift the lid on mental health conditions and break the stigma. Today we will be talking about major depressive disorder or MDD with special guest Dania Huswan who is 27 years old. She was born and raised in PJ. And she's currently studying a master's in counseling. She's on a second year and she's been diagnosed with MDD as well as panic disorder since 2014. So today we're going to talk about her experiences with MDD in particular. Before I get into asking Danya questions about her experience with MDD, I like to read out what MDD actually is and the symptoms that they present with. So what is major depressive disorder? Sadness is a natural part of the human experience. People may feel sad or depressed when a loved one passes away or when they're going through a life challenge, such as a divorce or serious illness. However, these feelings are normally short-lived. When someone experiences persistent and intense feelings of sadness for extended periods of time, then they may have major depressive disorder or MDD. MDD is also referred to as clinical depression. It is a significant medical condition that can affect many areas of your life. It impacts mood and behavior as well as various physical functions, such as appetite and sleep. People with MDD often lose interest in activities they once enjoyed and have trouble performing everyday activities. Occasionally, they may also feel as if life isn't worth living. Some people with MDD never seek treatment. However, most people with the disorder can get better with treatment. Medications, psychotherapy, and other methods can effectively treat people with MDD and help them manage their symptoms. In Malaysia, clinicians typically use the DSM-5 as a guide in diagnosing major depressive disorder. According to the DSM-5, here are the criteria for major depressive disorder. These include depressive symptoms. You must have five or more of these symptoms during the same two-week period that are a change from previous functioning. Depressed mood and or loss of interest or pleasure must be present. These are excluding symptoms clearly attributable to another medical condition. The first symptom is depressed mood for most of the day, nearly every day. The second symptom is loss of interest or pleasure. Number three, weight loss or weight gain. Number four, insomnia or hyperzomnia. Number five, psychomotor agitation or retardation. Number six, fatigue. Number seven, feeling worthless or excessive or inappropriate guilt. Number eight, decreased concentration. And number nine, thoughts of death or suicide. Along with five or more of the depressive symptoms that I've mentioned, the person must also have four of the following criteria. Number one, symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. Number two, episode not attributable to physiological effects of a substance or another medical condition. Number three, Episodes not better explained by schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, schizophreniform disorder, delusional disorder, or other specified and unspecified schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. Number four, no history of manic or hypomanic episode. And number five, exclusion does not apply if all manic-like or hypomanic-like episodes are substance-induced or are attributable to physiological effects of another medical condition. Hi, Dania. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hi, it's like a happy to be here. <laughs> are you? <laughs> so we're here to talk about your experiences with MDD, mm-hmm. but you were also diagnosed with panic disorder. That's right. How did you get diagnosed? Um, well, um, I guess it started with I was having lots of sleep problems, uh, difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, bad dreams. 
and I was getting panic attacks every morning, although I didn't know they were panic attacks at the time. And um, I used to call them gagging attacks. So I would... What does that mean? What What does that mean? Like, I just start gagging. Like, I feel nauseated oh. whenever I wake up, every time I wake up for in the morning. And um, yeah, so that was going on for several months. And I was feeling really down and stressed and uh, just in a really bad space. And then one day my mom was like, you know, I think we should go see a doctor about this. And that's how I got checked. That's how I got diagnosed. Was something happening at that moment like that could have triggered all of this? Um, well, for me, it was more like like it happened like a s- slow motion snowballing. Mm-hmm. And um, it happened over a long period of time. So it wasn't, there wasn't a significant event that caused it. It was more like it just kept building up and building up. The stress, the tension. I think a lot of it stemmed from stress at school. Because mm-hmm. I was studying, I was pursuing a medical degree at the time. Yeah. Which I didn't finish. Um, but it was really stressful. And I think I also stress myself out like unnecessarily. Maybe that's just my personality. It's like that. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> to be honest, I've actually heard a lot of stories about people who were in medical school, but they had to drop out or stop or, you know, th- take a break mm-hmm. because of their mental health problems. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's like particularly because of mm-hmm. how stressful it is to be in the cause mm-hmm. or like maybe it's a combination of factors but I think it's a combination of factors. It's not just because the course is so heavy and so stressful, but it's also the people who, I mean, this is what I think, like the people who tend to flock towards getting medical degrees, they have this predisposition to getting stressed out and getting, you know, being neurotic and having lots of expectations and parents' expectations and self-expectations. So I think it's like a combination of those two. Yeah, that's, I guess that makes sense. It's not just the cause, but like, there's a lot of expectations when you are in medical school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But you said like, this was like happening, like your panic attacks and like, Mm -hmm. um, how did your mom notice? Like, it was it like quite visible? I guess I didn't really, I'm not good at hiding things. So like when I was really feeling down and low and stressed, I'd cry and like my eyes would be really red and I'd call my mom and like, mom, I'm really sad or I'm really stressed. And so she was basically one of the first people to observe me going through that Mm -hmm. depressive cycle. And um, she has some experience of mental health, not personally, but like with family and friends, like Mm -hmm. she helped them through it. So and she sort of recognized the symptoms in me, I guess, because of her experience and um, decided that I should get some help. Did she accompany you? Yeah. How was that like, like the whole process? It was really different from anything I've ever experienced. Because like most of the time you go to the doctor, you get the medication and you get better and you forget about it, right? Mm-hmm. But like this time... Um, I just kept getting worse and worse every time I saw her. I mean, before I got better, I got worse. So every time I saw my doctor, it was like being in a dark place without any light. And you're looking for the light and you're going to the doctor and you're like, hey, can I have a light? And like, they're like passing you things that supposedly give light, but you don't have. But like when you touch it, it like becomes dark. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, like what? Did you feel like afraid about going to your first appointment? Mm, I wasn't afraid. I think I've been like really into mental health even before I got a mental illness. Like I was um, one of the propagators for like, oh, you should seek help. You should get it. You should see a counselor. You should talk about your issues, you know, be open about mental health and all that stigma and stuff. Like I didn't care about it. So being scared of the first appointment, that was an issue. That wasn't an issue for me. It was more like I was just so desperate for help. Mm -hmm. that this seemed like the only thing I can do. So I did it. How long was the appointment? The first ever time that you went to see... Did you go straight to a psychiatric clinic? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. I went straight to a psychiatric clinic that a friend, a friend of a family friend suggested. I think the first appointment was quite long, maybe one and a half hours. Um, and it was really pricey. It was really expensive. I guess my first experience of a psychiatrist was like, 
um, I felt I didn't feel as though I was getting the help that I actually needed. And I felt as though my problem wasn't as bad as the others. So mm-hmm. I wasn't getting as much attention. So yeah, I mean, like, you know, getting psychiatric help, it's a process. You have to find the best kind of help for yourself. And um, as a first experience, I mean, it was okay, but I didn't get better at that point. So like, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what you're trying to say is, I assume that you had a sort of expectation of what was going to happen. Oh, did I, you? Like, no, actually, at that time, I did not have any expectation at all. It's just me now looking back and mm-hmm. thinking, oh, maybe that wasn't the best situation, the best help that I could have gotten. Did you mean because of the money thing? Mm, yeah, because of the money thing, but also because I felt like the um, the psychiatrist wasn't prioritizing my problems. The situation back then is that you didn't know where to access help for mental health, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so like, I guess it wasn't easy to mm-hmm. find help. And then when you found help, the the right help for yourself. So that was like the first thing like you had access to because someone kind of like recommended mm-hmm. it to you? Yeah. Because you said that the psychiatrist you were seeing, you felt like your problems weren't like really serious Mm -hmm. where you felt that you weren't taken so seriously well actually like back then i felt like um she was the only person who could help me Um, but my parents weren't satisfied with how i was progressing with Mm -hmm. my mental illness so like only now looking back i can see that oh i didn't get the best treatment Mm -hmm. with her um, yeah, so we we decided to try other doctors and how long before clinics. you did that? Gosh, four months after the first psychiatrist. Yeah, like what sort of other options did you try to explore? Um, I still went to private clinics, but like friendlier kind of environments and mm-hmm. friendlier staff, mm-hmm. and then um, with a wider um, range of clinicians rather than just one clinician at a certain clinic so it was more like a team-based approach when they when they tried to when they tried to help you heal when they tried me to help me handle my depression and anxiety so it wasn't just a psychiatrist it was also a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a therapist so it was like a yeah so that's how I found like the right treatment for me was just through testing the waters of different healthcare workers I guess yeah. Mm-hmm. Like what sort of treatment were you under during that time? Mm, the uh, by that time I'd started this treatment called EMDR. Mm-hmm. Mm. So that's a type of therapy, right? Yeah, that's a type of therapy. Eye movement <laughs> something something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um w- okay, you, you had that and what was happening during the sessions? Um so it would be like I'd be discussing my issues with my therapist Mm -hmm. and he would talk to me about specific situations that caused me stress and then um we go through it while he did emdr so basically it's it's kind of like you know hypnosis hypnosis you imagine someone putting a clock and like your your eyes follow the clock except it's just his finger Mm -hmm. so um while while he was doing that i had like um the process is that you kind of come out of yourself you're like you see from an external point of view and um, you're not so attached to the things that you discuss so for example he'd go through the specific um, scene that happened in my day that made me really stressed out or really low and I wouldn't feel as triggered by that thought Mm -hmm. because he's having that calming effect with the EMDR and then as we as he discussed that, like he also bring up like how I can solve those issues if they came up in the future. Mm-hmm. So it's basically like replaying the scenario and coming up with coping mechanisms. So that's mm-hmm. most of the most of the sessions I had with that particular therapist were like that. He also taught me like assertive skills to try and apply them into real life. Um, he wasn't the only therapist I had though. I also went for art therapy. Mm-hmm. I'm really lucky because I'm able to, like, my family's able to afford and access these kind of help 
Yeah, so like I started art therapy and that was very different from therapy and seeing a psychiatrist because like we did art and we just talked about random things usually. Like it started off like with her getting to know me and then um, as I progressed with the sessions, like um, we started to delve deeper into my past. I guess it's a bit like psychoanalytical because mm-hmm. like he, she kind of digs into my past a bit like to find the source of the stress and the low self-esteem and low self-worth that I felt at that time. So yeah, I basically had like this team taking care of me. You had art therapy, you had EMDR and you were seeing a psychiatrist and mm-hmm. you were on medication. With it. Yeah. And how is the progress after that? How did, did, did things get a lot better? Slowly, really slowly, things got better. Um, I was basically trying all sorts of different medications, mm-hmm. um, testing. I think I was, uh, I've been on like three or four and different antidepressants before I found the one that I'm using now. Mm-hmm. And back then, like changing medication is like such a traumatic experience. <sighs> yeah, yeah. I <laughs> so like, you know, the withdrawals and then also the side effects and it was really stressful and it was really I don't know if anyone can ever be prepared for that I'm assuming you had like a trial and error phase Mm -hmm. with all of these medications like yeah what's what sort of things did you go through well I had like a weird sleep paralysis moment and then um some of these medication made my panic attacks worse Mm -hmm. or gave me more suicidal thoughts Mm -hmm. but also, there's a tendency to have more suicidal thoughts when you just start taking medication. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, um, it was such a gray area to figure out what was right and what was working and what was not working. Uh, but I spent a lot of time, like, just crying in bed, being unable to get out of the house and do anything productive, you know? It was just, like, dark days, I guess. <laughs> How is it, like, with your current medication? My current medication, like, um, you know, I never say that depression, once you have depression, anxiety, it never goes away. That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. Um, So my anxiety and depression is always present with me, but they're at manageable levels. Right now, the medication that I'm on, um, I guess it puts my depression and anxiety in manageable levels. Mm -hmm. I still get panic attacks. I still feel low, um, but I definitely feel a lot better with the medication I'm on. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So I know that right now you're in your second year doing your master's in counseling, right? Mm -hmm. How did you make that decision to take that course? Well, uh, after I quit medical school, I was kind of floating. Like, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Did I want to work? Did I want to study? Did I want to just stay in bed and not do anything at all? (laughs) Probably that. But anyway, (laughs) yes. (laughs) I guess... I worked part-time at several places and I was really active on Twitter and I saw all these people volunteering and doing things. And I think it was at that time that I found Minda as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and like... Um, oh, you weren't in the course yet. I wasn't you? in the course yeah. yet, yeah. Yeah, so I saw all these people helping people with mental health issues and I was like, you know, I want to do that too. And um, even, in fact, when I was still in medical school, when I was still like in the delusion that I'd become a doctor, um, I didn't want to pursue psychiatry. So mm-hmm. like uh, overlapping, you know. So I guess I decided I can't do psychiatry, but I can do psychology. Mm-hmm. I can I can do counseling or I can do clinical psychology. So I did some research into that, and I was really intrigued by clinical psychology. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like I realized that the work environment and the study the studies is kind of similar to medical school and I didn't want to put myself through that again so then I started looking up counseling and I was like oh this is actually very interesting and it's something uh, I might be able to do that's how I got into counseling (laughs) how do you manage like you you're still on medication and are you still going Mm -hmm. doing going to therapy yeah I do um how do you manage everything while also doing this course oh I'm still figuring that out, actually, to be very honest. Is I, it part-time or full-time? Full-time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's actually a lot of work. and um, But juggling like medication and therapy, it's not such a problem for me because I feel like it helps me 
it helps me function better mm-hmm. and makes me more able to do things that's related to my course. Mm-hmm. I feel as though um, the main issue that I have right now is like just juggling school and like family stuff. Um, but like um, going for therapy and getting my medication, that's, that, those are things that I'm okay with because mm-hmm. they help me manage better. Mm-hmm. What other things that do you do to take care of your mental health other than like, you know, medication and therapy? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of things actually that help me. And like, I think these play such a pivotal role as well, not just the therapy and medication. Um, it's a lot of like self-love and self-care, mm-hmm. which is really hard to do <laughs> when you're depressed and you're thinking that you hate yourself. But yeah. like... Um, I'm learning so I'm learning to love myself more it's actually really hard it's not I don't know how people do it sometimes <laughs> like I don't know I'm not in the best place right now mm-hmm. like I feel kind of like I've been feeling quite horrible as well so right now I'm like trying to understand how do people love themselves <laughs> it's hard like what do you do like do you have like you write stuff down or anything like that yeah I write stuff down and um, I like to write music and stories, so mm-hmm. I write that. Yeah, you, you play the ukulele. And I, I play the you, ukulele. You yeah. write poetry and stuff like that, Yeah, right? yeah, I wow. do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I wrote a lot of songs at the beginning of my depression, and I look back on it now, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> were they really sad songs? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, of course, right? They were really sad. But they helped me, like, express some of the... In- and the dark energy inside me, mm-hmm. the negative stuff. So it felt like a relief, a relief to do it. And um, it helped me to also convey to my support system how I was feeling. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, I could access my support system. And I think having a support system is really important when you have a mental illness. And for me, I was really lucky. I had like this fantastic support system, people who were willing to like help me out 24-7 my family and my close friends and um so when i shared my songs with them they're like oh, okay so this is how she feels you know sometimes mm. even they are not sure like because there's such a stigma and around mental health mental illness and like sometimes you don't accept that you're sick and sometimes it's difficult for others to see that you're sick because you don't look sick yeah and, yeah right so i think having that medium to sort of tell my story to them that helped a lot in like getting support and being understood do you find that when you're like in a bad place i guess do you find it difficult to tell others like maybe not through these mediums but Mm -hmm. like just like through talking um it was a struggle at first to be open about all these issues and thoughts, mostly because I was worried how they'd have a bad effect on other people. Like Mm -hmm. maybe they would bring them down or they might think I'm crazy or um, something negative like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I learned um, to be more open. I've always been a very open kind of person. I just can't lie and I can't hide things. It's just not in my nature. Mm -hmm. So... um, I guess it wasn't so hard for me to get into that being open with my feelings to other people and what I'm going through. Yeah. But I understand that some people find it really hard to do that, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You've recently joined a dance class, right? (laughs) Yeah, I did. How has that that been? You've only been been like in for a few sessions right um um yeah it's been good i really enjoyed them i mean i'm like totally i like really i my hand eye coordination is so bad but it's really fun and um it's kind of like my only only exercise right now (laughs) and it feels good to exercise um i think we're gonna wrap up soon so Mm -hmm. i do have a few last questions i guess um the first one if there is one thing people should know about mental illness what would that be Mm, based on my experience so far i think what people should really acknowledge is that everybody's journey with a mental illness is different Mm -hmm. but at the same time it doesn't mean that they're alone you know they're not alone can people have a fulfilling life while also being diagnosed 
with a mental illness like MDD? I definitely think so. And like, personally, I've achieved so much in the past few years. I mean, I don't like to acknowledge them, but <laughs> I guess I am <laughs> acknowledging them. Um, I mean, like, that's good, yeah. Yeah, I've done a lot in these past few years, more than I've done when I was, I mean, before the diagnosis, you know? So I feel like, and like, there's a lot of people who have lived through this and achieved so much um, out there. I can't think of any examples right now, but there are a lot of people, a lot of survivors, and they're doing things. What do you hope to change for people with mental health issues and also the general mental health scene in Malaysia? Mm, I guess in Malaysia, I would want there to be more awareness about mm -hmm. mental health. I I hate the idea that people look at people with mental illnesses like, oh, they're just lazy or not, they're not working hard enough or they're not praying enough. You know, I, I'd like to change or I would like to see a change in that kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely also um, bringing more access to help to people who can't access it. Like, I've been so lucky to be able to access help, and it's helped me a lot. I mean, I don't know if I'd still be alive if mm -hmm. it weren't for the help that I got. And I realize that not many people have that fortunate thing, you know? So, and hopefully with my master's in counseling, I can help provide a more affordable more accessible form of help <laughs> i that don't know sounds cool yeah that's, yeah um do you have any like last words as in do you have anything you want to say to people who are struggling right now um there is this song that i listen to sometimes mm -hmm. when i feel low and it sort of reminds me of what my support system tells me when i'm low and they they're always saying positive things and when you're in depression you kind of don't accept this positivity very mm -hmm. well because it just it feels like a lie mm -hmm. um, what's the song and what does the it song say? is called secret for the mad mm, by yeah, Dodi. Yeah, yeah yeah um uh, how does it go um like in a little bit of time it won't hurt so bad mm -hmm. and um like it gets better mm -hmm. i mean it's difficult to promise that because i can't guarantee it but um, I have sort of faith that things will get better and things will get better for you too. Okay. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. You're and talking welcome. About, you were very open about your experiences. <laughs> it went yeah. like from A to Z basically. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Maybe we'll have you again on the podcast. Sure. And that concludes today's episode on MDD. Thank you for listening to the Borat Mina podcast. This episode was brought to you by AIA Malaysia for the AIA See the Other Side campaign. If you'd like to know more about AIA, one of Malaysia's leading insurance providers, visit aia.com.my. You can also find Minda Kami on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and listen to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.